we were talking about what's called an inner well tracer test. And we do tracer tests in the field all the time. And we do them to get an idea of the heterogeneity, sometimes to calculate the residual oil saturation, the porosity. There are other ways to do that, as we talked about. But as reservoir engineers, we like to double check and triple check our work. Decisions you make or you are making are, are more than million dollar decisions. They're maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. And so you want to make sure that you have the right answer. One way to determine that is to do an inner well tracer test. Now, what do we mean by inner well? It means two wells. We go from an injector well to a producer well. And um, this is two phases. So you'll have an aqueous phase and an oleic phase, and you'll inject two different tracers. And the goal of that is to determine the residual oil saturation. So what you're going to do is, this is probably the end of a water flood, and where you're, you believe you're at residual water, oil saturation, and you want to determine what that is. And, um, and if it's very high, if SOR is very high, then you might make an argument to your managers that you should do an enhanced oil recovery scheme because there's a lot of oil remaining there that's capillary trapped and water flooding is not going to do it. If it's really small, then you say, well, it's not, not worth it, so we'll just um, not pursue this and, and, uh, and to sell the reservoir to some Aggies or something like that. Right? So, um, so the goal is to determine the residual oil saturation, maybe the porosity or pore volume as well. So again, you, you inject water with two tracers at the injector well, and then you have a producer well where you're producing water in two, trace, in, in two tracers. You're not going to produce any oil, or at least not any significant amount of oil, because you're at residual oil saturation. Okay, so the oil saturation is equal to SOR, the water saturation is 1 minus SOR. The first tracer we're going to choose is miscible in both water and oil. Okay, maybe some alcohols would be miscible in both, right? Or, or some long chain alcohols because it's got a molecular structure that's similar to oil. It's got some, you know, organic, you know, some carbons in it, but it's also got some polar attributes as well, like water. The other tracer is only going to be miscible in water. Okay, so something that's not miscible at all in, in oil. And we're going to have a partition coefficient. And what that is is the concentration of the tracer um, of this, of this uh, first tracer, right? The second tracer, it, there's no partition coefficient because it's only in the water. But this is the concentration that would be in the oil versus the water at equilibrium. So if you were to do a little experiment yourself at home and you would put water and oil into a cup and then add this tracer into a partition between the two, then maybe you can take a sample of the aqueous phase, a sample of the oleic phase, measure the concentration. You take the ratio of them and that would be your, your partition coefficient. Okay. So now we got our partition coefficient, we measure it in the lab, then uh, we can set up our equations for this. So the mass balance on those two tracers looks like this. Where does this come from? Well, this was based on our equations. I'll go back. It was based on our, our basic equation, which is, well, I'll even go, um, it, it's basically this equation over here, except we don't have any adsorption, so we don't have to worry about that. And we know what F is. F is defined this way, um, and CJ is defined as this way. So CJ was the concentration of component J, or tracer, um, in the aqueous phase. Um, and SW is the water saturation. CJO is the concentration of the tracer in the oleic phase times SO. And this F is this weighted sum of concentrations times the fractional flows of oil and water. So if I go back to where I was before, if I simplify that for our case, I get this. Now I know that 
there's no adsorption, right? There's no uh, tracer that absorbs onto the rock. So the equation for the first tracer looks like this. And I've written it like this because remember tracer one goes into both the water and the oil phase. So the fractional flow, uh, so you've got this partition coefficient K here, and then this is the second equation which is only missable in the aqueous phase. So there is no SO. One, another way to think about it is the partition coefficient is zero. We can simplify these. We can simplify them a few different ways. We know the fractional flow of water, FW, is one, and we know it of FO is zero. So that term goes away. This is just one, and, and that's why I get this C1, partial of C1W with respect to XD. Likewise, the partial of C2W with respect to XD. And then the coefficients over here, we have, um, we can pull out the SW times K1, K times SO and you get this, and um, we can remember that SW is 1 minus SOR, and SO is equal to SOR. We know by now that these equations, that these equations are, um, tell us about the breakthrough time and the velocity of the concentration fronts. And, um, Essentially, the breakthrough time is equal to this coefficient. So what does that mean? That the breakthrough time of tracer number one is one over the velocity of one, which is equal to SW, which is one minus SOR, plus K times SOR. And the breakthrough time of the second tracer is one over the velocity of that second of constant concentration of that second tracer, which is SW, or 1 minus SOR. So now we have two equations. We know K, we measure it in the lab. We know the breakthrough times. We know the breakthrough times because we're going to measure those, right? If we're going to do this experiment in the field, and it's going to be very expensive for us, we're certainly going to have an operator measuring what time that tracer showed up. So we know the breakthrough times. We might not know the dimensionless breakthrough time. All right, so the operator is gonna tell us, well, it came out after um, 17 days. Well, you know, and then you're gonna ask the operator, well, what's the dimensionless time? And the operator is gonna have no idea what you're talking about, okay? Um, but, but you can do that. And you know that the dimensionless time is related to the porosity and the pore volume, which you may or may not know. We'll assume that you don't know it. So what that means is that you have two equations and two unknowns. One of the unknowns is SOR. The other unknown is either the porosity or the pore volume. Okay, and what that would look like is if you measured the concentration of your two tracers at the producer well, then tracer number two would come out and tracer number one would come out at a different time, okay? So based on that, let's do an example problem. Please do turn on your video monitors. And this was an old exam problem. This is an old final exam problem. I sent you an email with this, um, and I also posted it on Canvas, so if you have a tough time seeing the screen, then, then you um, can download that. But um, what I say is consider a 1D reservoir containing oil at a uniform residual saturation, SOR. Water is flowing at 1,000 barrels per day. At T is equal to zero, a second water stream is introduced at the injector that contains these two tracers. They're both non-dispersing, so the dispersion coefficient is zero. We've been making that assumption for some of these tracers for a while. And it's non-absorbing, so there's no tracer that adsorbs onto the rock grains. 
Tracer 1 remains only in the water phase, but Tracer 2 partitions into the residual oil phase. So it's both in the water and the oil. The partition coefficient is 3. So that's the concentration in the oil to the water. That means that this, um, this tracer prefers to be in the oil phase. It's got an affinity for the oil phase, right? Because that number is greater than 1. But it's in both the oil and the water. And then when we do our measurements at the producer well, tracer 1 comes out after 20 days and tracer 2 after 40 days. Calculate the pore volume and residual oil saturation. So uh, what I'll first do is get you to set up your two equations and two unknowns. So I think what, what we wrote is, is that we had SW plus K or KOW is what I called it in this case times SO. And then the second one is equal to SW, right? I think that that's what we had. Um, right, right, right. So that's what that is. And if I want to write it in terms of SW is 1 minus SOR plus KOW times SOR. And this is equal to 1 minus SOR. Everybody got that? So... Uh, I've got two equations, but um, I got SOR, and I don't know my dimensionless breakthrough times either. Those are dimensionless. What is the what is the dimensionless time equal to in terms of time? We, we this is the dimensionless breakthrough time, so we want to relate it to the to the real breakthrough time. But if you remember how we defined it, defined dimensionless time before. It was volume injected divided by pore volume, right? So the pore volume is, is VP, and we could expand that out to like A, L, V, but, but the problem states pore volume, so I probably just want to leave it that way. And then how much water have I injected, or, or what's the relationship there? Lower times time. Right, very good. So it's Q times time. And by the way, I gave you Q in there, right? So Q is barrels per day. Time is day, so the numerator is barrels and the denominator is barrels. And I can write the same thing. So this is T breakthrough 2. I'm, you know, I'll put a, a D here to indicate this is dimensionless. And this is QT breakthrough 1 divided by VP. Okay. So those are two equations, one, two, we have two unknowns, SOR and VP, everything else we know. So maybe the next step, why don't you plug in the numbers and see if there's an easy way to solve these two equations. And um, the second one, we have 1 minus SOR is 1,000 times 20 divided by VP. And then we see that 1 minus SOR plus 3 SOR is really 1 plus 2 SOR. So you have two equations and two unknowns. Lots of different ways you could solve that. What I did is I recognized that this is twice this, right? This is 40 times 2. So what I know is that this must equal to 2 times that. You don't have to do it that way. There's lots of ways you can solve this, but I said 1 plus 2 SOR is equal to 2 times 1 minus SOR. You see that? All right, and then, then it's just algebra. 4 SOR is equal to 1. That means that SOR is 1 fourth or 0.25. Okay. Yeah, I got uh, 26,667, I think, 
that's in standard barrels? That would be in uh, reservoir barrels. So uh, this is the, the volume, this is the pour volume, this is at reservoir conditions. So it's in, um, it, it's just in barrels or reservoir barrels. So not stock tank barrels, but yes, I got the same thing, Jake. So um, I could have used either equation. I would have gotten exactly the same answer. Um, if I use the second equation, then I can say VP is equal to 1,000 barrels per day times 20 days divided by 1 minus SOR. So it's 1 minus 0.25. If you plug all that in, you get 26,667 barrels. That's the pour volume. Um, had I asked for the porosity, I would have either had to given you the bulk volume or given you the area and the length so you can calculate the bulk volume. And we know the porosity is the pore volume divided by the bulk volume. What I wanted to remind you of is, is kind of a really important formula. NPD is the dimensionless oil recovery. So the dimensionless oil recovery is the actual oil recovery in barrels divided by the pore volume in barrels. And that is equal to ED, the displacement deficient, efficiency, times EA times EI times SOI minus SOR. Okay, this is a key formula. We've seen it before. We have not learned EA and EI, and in, this is what's called the aerial displacement efficiency in 2D, and this is the vertical displacement efficiency, which is usually in 3D, but we're only in 1D. So up until now, these have been equal to 1. SOI is the initial oil saturation. You can't recover more oil than it's originally there. So even if SOR was zero and these were one, the dimensionless oil recovery would just be SOI. Maybe that number is 80% or 70%. You're gonna have some water present. You also can't produce from a water flood below the residual oil saturation. It doesn't matter if you inject water for a million years, at least in theory, you'll never recover that SOR. So NPD is going to be SOI minus SOR. That number will always be less than one. These things are static. This is your initial saturation. This is the theoretical value that you would get if you injected tons and tons of four volumes of water. These three are time dependent. Initially, they're small, but as time goes on, they approach one. So if you were to go long enough times, all these would be one, and then NPD would be SOI minus SOR. Now, we learned ED, which is 1D displacement efficiency, and that was in like a 1D reservoir or a 1D rock core. And what we learned is, is that the if you did NPD divided by SOI minus SOR, that would be ED, this would go from zero to one This would be dimensionless time. You would get a straight line for a while, and then you would taper off. Okay. This is the breakthrough time. That's when water first reaches the producer well. Then you're producing both water and oil, and you sort of taper off. And how much you taper off depends on the 
heterogeneity. It depends on the mobility ratio, like how viscous the oil and water are and what the relative permeabilities are. But this ED is, is a time dependent type thing. And it's related to the fact that if we were to plot SW versus distance, we know that we usually get something like this. Right? This is SOR, but this is my moving wall, but we lose, but we leave behind oil. This is unswept oil. Right, and even after breakthrough, even at breakthrough, you're going to have some unswept oil behind there. And that's why ED is less than 1. If we didn't have this, then ED would be 1, at least after breakthrough. But, and then the other thing is, is that after breakthrough, as time goes on, this amount of unswept oil gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That's why if you water flood for long enough, you'd get ED is equal to one. Now I say water flood for long enough, that could be 100 years, 200 years or longer. Many times it's very difficult to impossible to, to inject water long enough to truly get to SOR. Okay, at minimum it might take a few years or a few decades. But we do, we have lots of fields where we do water floods for decades. We have, we have oil fields that we've been water flooding for a very long time and we're still water flooding, we're still producing some oil along with a lot of water. But now we're going to talk about aerial displacement efficiency and that's in two dimensions. And a typical, you know, we call this a quarter five spot pattern where we have an injector well here and a producer well over here. And these are no flow boundary conditions. So this is called a quarter five spot. We'll talk more about why it's called a quarter five spot a little later. If you inject water over here and you have oil, then the easiest path is to go straight here. This is the fastest path. But you're going to have some water go around the edges. And these are called streamlines. And as time goes on, you know, the, the amount of, the amount, this is unswept over here. This is unswept over here, and this is the swept region. So I tried to come up with an analogy. I, I don't know if this will help or not, but if I had a, if my lawn, my backyard looks something like this, and I was cutting the grass, and I went from one corner to the other corner, you know, I'd be, you know, I'd, I'd be cutting grass, maybe I'd go straight from there to there, and then maybe I would start going along the edges, and as time goes on, more and more of the grass would get cut, and so I would, you know, and some of it would still be uncut. So the uncut part would be unswept, the cut part would be swept. And this is aerial displacement efficiency. And it depends on time. EA eventually approaches one. And it also depends on the heterogeneity, how heterogeneous your reservoir is. And it also depends on the mobility ratio. So if you had a viscous oil and a, you know, your water was not very viscous, one centipoise, then that water would find a pathway and break through early. And then over time, it would take a lot longer to, to sweep all that. If, you, if your oil was a low viscosity, it would probably 
push it out better. And we'll look at that and talk about those patterns. But this is EA, and you can think of the water molecules as almost following these path lines. Think of them as little tunnels or pathways to go from the injector well to the producer well. And each one of these tunnels or pathways is a 1D displacement. So on those 1D displacements, you have ED, but then when you put them all together, you also have EA. So in two dimensions, in the absence of three dimensions where we can ignore vertical sweep efficiency, you have ED times EA. And at least for finite times, ED is less than one, EA is less than one, SOI minus SOR is less than one. And so when you start multiplying um, three uh, numbers together, then um, that are less than one, you get a pretty small number. And so that's why our recovery factors in many, many oil reservoirs are much, much less than 100% and much less than 50%. So a typical recovery from a water flood, even after years or decades, might be one third. And a third that's left behind might be this unswept oil that if we kept on injecting water long enough, maybe we recover. And then we have a, a third that's um, due to residual oil saturation. 